Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. First Corinthians 12, come on. First Corinthians 12. Of course, Brother Ray was with us Sunday. What a blessing he was. Uh, all the messages he gave us, the two on Saturday morning to help us with Helps Ministries, and then uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, what a blessing. So please be sure and go back and get those messages. If you did not get Saturday's messages, I encourage you, you can get them by podcast. Uh, we actually uploaded all those. If you don't know about podcasts and you got our app, then you got the ability to get them. They're right there on our app. If you do have uh, one of the podcast uh, access points like uh, iTunes, Podbean, anything like that, all those you can do a search for Pastor Daryl Baker and you can bring our podcast to your phone or wherever you listen to, whatever device you have, and you can go check out those messages. We didn't do a video of Saturday. That's why they're just on the podcast. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Sunday night, both we have them on our website by video as well as audio as well. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise First Corinthians chapter 12. We are talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Bible prophesied yes. that in the last days there would be a latter rain of an outpouring of the gifts of the Spirit through the Holy Spirit. There was a former at the day of Pentecost where that began. And then there's going to be a latter and the Bible's clear. You and I, one of the things we'll see later on as we complete this series is you and I have to be crying out to God for this latter rain. Yes. We got to be asking him for it. Yes. You got to be asking God to pour out these gifts upon you. First Corinthians 12 <clears throat> verse one tells us concerning these spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So by the end of this study, you should be able to define all three categories of gifts and all nine gifts and what they are. If you can't, you're still ignorant, and that ain't good. <clears throat> ignorant doesn't mean stupid. Ignorant means you lack understanding, but you're being taught the understanding of these gifts. So you should not lack that. You, you should all have understanding of these gifts. Amen? Amen? Now, we've already covered out of these nine, which they begin to be talked about as a manifestation gift in verse 7, revealed in verses 8, 9, and 10. We've already talked about two categories. We just completed the second of two. First category was inspiration gifts. What do inspiration gifts do? Say something. Say something. And those inspiration gifts say in relationship to what we know Scripture is clear about, what do they say? Three things. They are either words of edification, exhortation, or comfort. If they're not, they're not in that category of what we know of words of uh, gifts of inspiration. Gifts of inspiration are prophecy, which is just simple prophecy, or tongues and then interpretation of tongues. I wanted to do it tonight. I wasn't ready for it, and I didn't feel... After we kind of got in the service, that was the direction we should go anyway. Sunday, I'm planning on replaying the word that God gave us back in May, which I've sent to everybody by text now and made it available to you by you know, every possible way we can. And I'll tell you why that's important. And, uh, you know, Kathy even shared it. I'm not going to, I'm rarely going to go back and share something that, that I gave just because I don't want people thinking, well, Pastor's going to do that because he said it. No, I didn't say it. God did. Yeah. But, but realize God spoke that to us, so he now holds us accountable for that word. Yes, and if we don't go back and reexamine and make sure we're hearing what it says and doing it, we're going to be held accountable. So I told you. Yes. I told you about this. Yes. So part of that is understanding the importance of having your heart set on God. So these gifts are significant to that because if your heart really is set on God, you get close to God, God's going to rub off on you. And those gifts are going to be something that you're going to be easily able to function in because you're going to know when he's leading you to do so. Or at least know what he's leading you to do in helping people. And then he will manifest the gifts as he wills. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, again, we covered the inspiration gifts. We've also covered the revelation gifts. Revelation gifts reveal something. They are, one, words of wisdom, which is... Future tense words of which is pastor present and discerning of 
which is what? Discerning what is motivating the spirit of a person, whether it's God or not. And so that's very important. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to get into the power gifts. Amen. Say power gifts. power gifts. These are awesome. Energy gifts is one of the ways I, uh, we shouldn't just say energy. Divine energy. Right. Lester Summerall in teaching this, I believe inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, you know, in relating to talking about them as power gifts, he said, I think one of the ways we should better understand them in the body is divine energy gifts because it is divine energy. Realize that these power gifts are not unusual for God. They're just unusual for us because they come out of the spirit and obviously just, uh, exhibit his power. Uh, we're going to look at verse nine. If you're in verse nine, say amen. amen. So in these gifts, he says to another faith is given. This is one of the power gifts because this is we're going to talk about tonight. It's not general faith. It's, it's not a generic general faith or a saving faith. It's a supernatural manifestation of faith. So to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, that's another power gift, and to another working of miracles. So those are the three power gifts. Faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles. Tonight, we're going to start on the gift of faith. We're not going to finish it, but we're going to start on it because we want to clearly understand what he's talking about. So there's general ways you could describe it. I kind of go with what I have heard Brother Hagin define it as, so we don't categorize it in a position of generic or general faith. I like the term that Brother Hagin used to use, special faith. Mm -hmm. It is special faith. Why? Because it is God doing everything in that moment for you. Amen. You do nothing. You do nothing to initiate what's happening. God is the one initiating all of it by form of you walking in this gift of faith and therefore God responding and manifesting what's happening. So we're going to talk about this in detail. Now, I'm going to give you a really definitive uh, understanding here of what the uh, gift of faith or special faith is all about. I don't, I don't expect you because I'm not going to read this 15 times. I don't expect you to write this whole statement down. I want you to listen carefully. I'll, rec I'll quote it a couple times. But then I'm going to give you a definitive definition of what you need to get. Amen. Amen? So, understanding the gift of faith. We observe the gift of faith in operation when God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's significant. Because the connection of the gift of faith is connecting to the power of the Holy Spirit. We observe the gift of faith in operation when God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, performs supernatural exploits for a human when there is no human strength or intelligence involved. He is performing supernatural exploits, listen to this, for a human, for someone, where there is no human strength or even intelligence involved. Amen. Why? God's doing it all. Amen. He's doing it all. And He's doing it through this manifested gift called the gift of faith or special faith. Now, here's what I do want you to write down, okay? Uh, in this gift, this is what I want you to write down about the gift of faith or special, or special faith. In this gift, God does something supernatural for you. Several statements you're going to want to have about this. These are the ones I would want you to get recorded. In the gift of faith, God does something supernatural for you. Now, I'm going to tell you up front... This goes, in, uh, this goes a, a little contrary to what Brother Hagin teaches about the gift of faith. I'm going to lean here uh, to Lester Summerall and Howard Carter because Howard Carter was instructed by the Lord directly to learn these gifts and teach them to the body. That was his assignment. Amen. That was Howard Carter's assignment. And, uh, and even Brother Hagin said, of all that he knew Howard Carter as well, uh, not like real well, but he knew him. S Summerall was close friends with Howard Carter. Probably one of the closest friends Howard Carter ever had on the earth was Lester Summerall. And so he believed that God literally combined him with Howard Carter to learn about how to flow in these gifts and carry on the, the very message of what God taught him so that it could get to the body of Christ. Howard Carter didn't even want to teach it to the body in the form of a book or anything. He did finally write a book, but he was really pressed to do it. 
because he didn't want attention by anybody. Howard Carter was an absolute gifted, talented, supernatural, blessed artist. As good as any, they say. But all of a sudden, he started garnering so much attention for his paintings and people wanting to buy them, he quit painting because he didn't want attention. He, uh, Lester Sonwell said he came up with the most witty inventions, the most incredible. I mean, just like, how did you think of that? Of course, you knew it was God showing him. But then he kind of got noted, 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 notoriety, I was going to say, from doing certain inventions. So he quit doing it because he did not want attention. He didn't want any attention drawn to him. So when, uh, the world, when World War II broke out, he had just gotten baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he was beginning to learn about flowing with the Holy Spirit and beginning to learn about these gifts. And he got drafted. And he told uh, the, the uh, army that drafted him in his country, I'm not going to go fight. Uh, why? Because I just got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I need to learn about these gifts. God wants me to learn about these gifts. Well, you're either going to go fight or you're going to go to prison. If I go to prison, can I take my Bible? Yep, then I'll go to prison. And so he did. And he was in prison for the rest of the war. Now, God literally showed him all during that time. What else are you going to do? Locked up in a little cell by yourself. This guy was locked away with God for a long period of time to study these gifts and learn them. And every one of them he saw manifest in the time that he was in the jail, uh, actually in prison, uh, until uh, World War II was over. And when he got out, God mightily used this man. Now, this was a man who was a more, in, not obviously living in our day, closer to our day, modern day Wigglesworth. If you go study about Wigglesworth, the people that knew him, you'll find out that people that knew him said, I knew nobody better to be aware of the Holy Spirit daily than Smith Wigglesworth. This man was so in tune with God. They would even ask his family, grandsons, etc., What's he like at home? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. So in tune with God that we would be sitting at home as a family. They didn't watch TV. No television, of course, in uh, context of a lot of homes that day. No TV. Uh, he did not have newspapers. Only allowed the Bible in his home. But they'd just be having a family gathering. And his grandson said, in the middle of us just spending some time together talking as a family or having a meal, he would excuse himself from the table. And at first we thought maybe it was something, you know, something was wrong. He'd disappear, you know, into his uh, room for an hour, two hours, three hours. And eventually, sometimes not come out till we're all gone, but sometimes come back out. Or, and, you know, and, and Paul would say, okay, he said, the Lord called me away. And I mean, the Lord could interrupt him at any moment. And, and just he, he was so sensitive, he said, I mean, he just knew. And he would go off and spend time with the Lord. And every time he would get something from God. Or God would use him. He was bore out by what obviously happened in those visitations or those times with the Lord. So next to him, following his life of one who walked in that sensitivity to the Lord, Howard Carter. Lester Sumrall said, I never met such a great man of faith in all my life. Now, Lester Sumrall was in, in many ways was a great man of faith. But Lester Sumrall said, I met no greater man of faith in all my life. Than Howard Carter. Never watched anybody walk in the kind of faith that man walked in. This man walked in the gift of faith all the time. And I watched it manifest in all of his life and ministry. Now I could go into a lot of detail how they met, which was supernatural. And you could obviously understand this guy clearly heard God. But I'm going to lean, therefore, over to where this is a specialty or a special gifting that God used Howard Carter in. I've learned from all these great ministers, even Hagen. That God tends to use in certain people's lives that are just called as teachers to the body, specific areas of giftings or areas they'll use them in. Because nobody could really truly study all the subjects of everything with the Bible and get understanding the way they could if they just focused on one or two. So all the time you'll hear people say it and it's true, Brother Hagin will tell you. What was Brother Hagin's mandate by Jesus in a visit visitation to the body of Christ? Teach my people faith and healing. So you want to learn about faith and healing? Go study Brother Hagin. Because that was a mandate by Jesus given to him, actually in one of eight visitations where the Lord appeared to him and said, this is what I want you to teach my people. Well, therefore, if you want to truly learn about faith and healing, guess who I would go to? I'd go to Hagen because that's what he was here to teach God's people. Amen? Amen. But Howard Carter heard the same thing from the Lord on the gifts of the Spirit. Lester Sumrall didn't really have a mandate from God, but he was used by God in the supernatural and especially when it came to dealing with demons. If you want to learn about demonic powers and how to deal with them, I'll guarantee you what, we've gone through it before. There's a series that uh, Lester Sumrall had called uh, uh, Angel, what is it called? Um, 
I forget the titles of these. Uh, no, no. Alien entities. It's kind of an unusual title. Alien entities. But you're not talking about Mars and outer space creatures. You're talking about demons. What's amazing is some were all cast out. I'm serious. People that knew him. No telling how many thousands of demons he cast out of people. But you know what's amazing? Most people would think in that ministry you'd see the demons. He never saw a demon in his life. Never did. Said I never wanted to. So why would you need to? If you, if you discern the demons there, you don't need to see it. You don't have to see it to cast it out. So he said, I think God set it up that way on, on purpose that I wouldn't be dealing with something just because I saw it. But I would only cast it out because God told me to. Amen. But in the area of gifts of the spirit, man, I'm going to tell you what, Howard Carter, this guy walked in all these gifts. And what's amazing is he shows a more biblical model in the Bible to back these gifts up. Where you can see that's exactly what they are. And I say all that for the reason of what I'm about to tell you about definitions of the gift of faith. So you don't get confused based on things we may have taught in the past of what I initially learned. How many know you just keep on learning? Amen. Even myself. So in this gift, God does something supernaturally what? Listen to this. For you. For you. Now that's a difference between the gift of faith and the working of miracles. Because the working of miracles, as we'll get to later, God is doing something miraculous through you, not for you. So the working of miracles, and these are different because God could do something supernaturally for you that's really not a miracle, but it's supernatural. But he could do things through you that's miraculous. But here's why you got to understand the difference. But that when God does something in the manifestation of the, of a uh, of, of miracles and the working of miracles. Is it a miracle to God? No, that's everyday stuff to him. Right. It's just a miracle to us. Right. Amen. Yes. Cause it's not something we could do. It's only something God could do yes. in a supernatural manifestation. When a man stretched his hand withered and it became whole, guess what? That's not a miracle to God. That's everyday stuff to God. Right. That's not miraculous to him. That's nothing for him to do. Are you kidding me? The guy who put all the planets in place right. calls every star by name. Right. How hard is it? That's not a miracle to him. It just is to us. Yes. So working in miracles is God manifesting his power through us. Gift of faith is again, God doing something supernaturally. Say supernaturally. supernaturally. God doing something supernaturally for us. Now, it primarily falls under, although not totally limited to, it primarily falls under the category of provision or protection. Amen. All through the Bible, provision or protection. It does go beyond that, but that's where we primarily see it functioning, where God supernaturally is providing for somebody through the gift of faith. Amen. Or God is supernaturally protecting somebody by the gift of faith. Now, again, this is not generic faith, and I'll explain why. All right. Second statement about the gift of faith. The gift of faith is a complete opposite to the working of miracles. I just describe why the gift of faith is a complete opposite to the working of miracles. Complete opposite, because one is a supernatural thing that's happening for you. Working of miracles is a miracle that's working through you. So they're total opposites in that sense. Amen. Final statement about the gift of faith. This is important. The gift of faith is evidenced. Say evidenced. Evidence. Say it out loud. Evidence. The gift of faith is evidenced when a supernatural event occurs without human effort. We're going to show you a definitive example of this. The gift of faith is evidenced when a supernatural event occurs without. That's important. Without human effort. Effort. You're not involved in it. And I'm going to show you the difference here of where there are some miracles that happen, but humans were involved as opposed to a working of faith, supernatural, something happening of which the human was not involved. God did it all by himself. Amen. But he does that based off the gift of the manifestation of the gift of faith. Now, real quick, go to Romans 12. Now, I know most of you are going to know what I'm telling you uh, the next few minutes, but you got to understand you can't come to church and say, I already know that. Because number one, you can slip from stuff, but more importantly, number two, guess what? A pastor has the responsibility to teach everybody from a baby Christian starting out 
to a senior believer that's been walking with God. You have to feed the whole family of God. So we don't just give you what you want all the time. You don't go sit down at the table, get every little thing you want. You get everything that's good for you. But everybody has something on that table they need to receive of. So don't ever take it like, well, I already know this. This is boring. Why are we talking about this? Well, that means you really don't care about anybody else then. Because they may not know it. Amen? And don't just think you do. Right. Romans 12, 3. So it is not what is known as a form of generic faith. Generic faith, which God gives and we can then develop on. God gives us a form of generic faith and we build on it. But that's not the gift of faith. Romans 12, 3 tells us this. For I say to you, the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, underline it, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So this is different than the Holy Spirit manifesting this supernatural manifestation of faith. That's why you can see now it is different. It's not the same. Because God gives to everyone. Everyone. Say so that includes me. He gives to everyone a measure of faith. So that's what we call a generic or a general type of faith that you were given by God that's already in your heart that you then have the ability to develop. Romans 10. Back up. To Romans 10. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... So realize that it's not just generic listening to it with my ear. Because if all I had to do is just sit in a church and listen to the word preached and I'm going to get faith out of that. Then this is an area that I kind of disagree with some others that, that I know uh, that I've learned from or listened to in my past. I do not believe if you just sit in church and the words being preached, that you get faith. Because if that was true, why are we not seeing more people walking in it? Right. Amen. Amen? Right. Now, I understand you could maybe get it and not use it, but the truth is, it's amazing how many people think they have it who really don't. And they've been sitting here in the Word preached. So hearing there is the key uh, context of what we got to understand about that verse. Because that word hearing means to have understanding of. Right. Yes. So you got to give yourself to what you're hearing to get it in your heart. So it's not knowledge in the head here. Understanding is of the heart. This is why Jeremiah 3.15, this is why you need a pastor. You cannot fully develop in faith without one. You can claim you can. But Jeremiah 3.15, God said, I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So it begins with a knowledge in the head, but it's got to become understanding in the heart. And the way God does that is through the teaching of the word through your shepherd. One of the ways. So we understand the hearing there is not just sit and get it in my ear. I got to listen to what's being said. I got to give some understanding of my, excuse me. I got to give some attention to my mind uh, to what that's saying to understand from the perspective of knowledge. But true understanding is of the heart. And when you look that up, faith comes by understanding and understanding by the word, which the word there is rhema. It's not Logos. It's Rhema. What's that referring to? The spoken or in this in that verse, the proclaimed or preached word. So to get faith built, you got to hear it proclaimed. Yep. Amen. Amen. Now think about this as we go into looking at tonight Old Testament examples of people walking in the gift of faith. Realize this. They didn't have shepherds back then. Amen. Where are they going to get faith built up? There are not a lot of options for them. Right. Are you listening? Yeah. They didn't have a church, most of these people in the Old Testament to go to. They might have had a synagogue once beyond Moses and the initial tabernacle and all that. But not like what you and I get blessed to sit in here. Are you listening? They didn't have the Bible. It's being written. They couldn't go home and open their Bible. Feed on the Word of God. If you want faith to be developed in your heart, now I'm just telling you according to those scriptures. It's not going to come by you just reading it silently. People think that. That's not what that verse said. It said faith comes by understanding, and that understanding comes by the rhema, the spoken, the preached word. So you should be decreeing that word over you as you're, spe as you're reading it, speaking it as you're reading it. Amen? Why? I don't know. God set it up that way. So you got to understand that that is talking about this generic faith we've been given, that everybody has the ability to build. Everybody has the ability to develop. Amen? 
But what we're about to do is go back to the Old Testament, of which these people did not have the ability to do that because they don't have a place to go and hear the Word of God preached. Right. Are you listening? Amen. So most of what you're seeing of supernatural events happening in the Old Testament was the gift of faith where God is manifesting his faith through the Holy Spirit in the lives of these people, of which you know it's true because he's winding up doing everything that's being done. They're doing nothing. So realize this is not general faith. You and I are so blessed because, again, all even the New Testament saints. Now, they did have Old Testament scriptures. Yes, they did hear the preaching of the apostles that were under Jesus. So they could get faith that way. But you and I can go and just pick it up any time and just proclaim it to ourselves. Amen. How privileged we are yes. and how sad to say most Christians don't take advantage of what they have available. But we should in Jesus name. Right. Yes. So it's not talking about this generic faith that we've been given by God that we can now develop and build because that is something God gave to everybody. But the gift of faith is distributed as the Holy Spirit wills, not the father. Amen. Go to Daniel six. Let's go to some examples tonight. This will better help us define, look at, understand, and see uh, how this gift of faith works in operation in the lives of some other people. And a bunch of them happen in the Old Testament. As I've already told you, every gift, every one of the nine manifestation gifts are seen in operation in the Old Testament except for tongues and interpretation. Because that was something that could only happen once you were born again. And the Holy Spirit now inside you could give your spirit utterance to speak, obviously, in a heavenly language. They couldn't do that. They weren't born again. So here we are about a story about Daniel. Now, I'm going to read a lot of verses tonight because I don't want to just kind of pick and choose and kind of go through here. Even if you've heard the stories before, I think too much gets left out. Kind of try to do that in preparation. And I just kept feeling nudged by the Holy Spirit. You're going to leave stuff out. So it's good to read the whole account, even if we go through it all fairly quickly to get to some key points. Amen? Amen. So, so here was a plot against a very godly man named Daniel, uh, which some leaders of the day did not like because he was getting preeminence. And the reason he was getting preeminence, as you're going to see, is because the Spirit of God was resting on his life, and therefore he knew things that these other people didn't know because God knows everything. Daniel 6, 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom at that time, 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them. So they are under these governors, three of them. One of these governors is who? Daniel. So that the king, Darius, would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over all the whole realm. So he's about to make him the ruler over the entire area. So these other governors and satraps sought to find some charge against him. Daniel, uh, against, excuse me, a charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. May it be said of us. Yeah. You know, people can try to find some form of charge against you. But you know what? May it be said that they could find nothing against us because we are faithful to our God. Now, if he could do that in the Old Testament, we can't do that in the new. I said we can't do that in the new. We should be found faithful in serving our God. Moving on. Verse four. No, nor. Was there any error or fault found in him? And these men said, we shall not find any, uh, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. What are they trying to do? Puff him up? Get his, get his ear so they're puffing him up. All the governors of the kingdom, administrators and satraps and the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any God or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So how can you get a king deceived? Puff him up. Get the focus on him. 
8. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Yeah, that's good, man. Praise the Lord. They're not going to serve any of the gods. They're not going to be able to do that to anybody else but bow down to me. Watch this, verse 10. I know you know the story, but read on. Now, Daniel, when Daniel knew that this writing was signed, underline that. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, you're about to see a manifestation of the gift of faith. Because if you didn't just understand what we read, don't just take this some old kid's story. This happened. Right. What happens to anybody, anybody who does not honor the, the uh, king here, what happens? He is cast into the den of? Lions. Daniel knows this. Now, we read this story here thousands of years later, heard it in kids' church, maybe seen little videos about it and all that, and think it's just really cool and all that. Who wouldn't have done that? I'm serious. How many of you? Think about it. Right. Knowing today, if our president... I uh, had people come to him and say, for the next 30 days, if anybody worships any other God, for the next 30 days, any other God, they will be thrown into a den with lions. I mean, think some Christians are going to be pretty private in their worship for the next 30 days. I'll guarantee a lot of them would be. Are you listening? Now watch this. What you will not see here is an evidence of the gift of faith. You will see no aspect of fear on Daniel at all. Right. None. Because faith and fear don't go together, obviously. Right. Remember, Daniel doesn't have generic faith. God hadn't been able to give that yet. Right? So this is a special faith manifestation as you're about to see. So he knew the writing was signed. Yet he did what? He went home. This was his custom. Into his upper room with his windows what? So I could see going home to worship, but maybe keep the window closed. Right? right. So he, uh-uh, I'm opening the window, man. I want everybody to hear. Amen. He opened his window toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Easy to read the story today and say you'd do the same. But I will tell you, without the gift of faith, you probably would not. I'm serious. You're about to become lion's food. Now, it's bad enough to think about being thrown to the lions, but going through what you're going to go through when they get a hold of you. Anybody got any idea how fun this is going to be? Verse 11. Then these men assembled, found Daniel praying. Don't you know they were waiting for him at his home outside the window? found Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. They went before the king. They spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Now listen, Darius liked Daniel, very much so. He now realized he's been sucked into a trap. What's he going to do? Man, he's got a choice to either uh, dishonor his word, which therefore he's not going to be looked upon much as a king by the people anymore because he doesn't keep true to his word, or he got to go through with what he has now done. Right. Verse 14, the king, when he had heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Is there some way I can get him out of this? And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him, tried to figure out a way but could not come up with any resolve. 15, then these men approached the king and said to the king, so they kind of realize, is he stalling? What's the deal? Come on, man. Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Now, I'm going to tell you what's so dumb about this in relationship to what these guys are doing. It's how the devil works. Convinces these guys, if we killed Daniel, then one of us could become the ruler 
And I'll tell you, the king's going to know what you did. You really think he's going to make you a ruler? Right. No. But that's how stupid deception is. Right. And that's how powerful deception is. Because you don't even see beyond the end of your own nose. Right. To realize he's going to know what we did. There's no way he's going to pick us for that position. <clears throat> 16. So the king gave the command. Had no choice. They brought Daniel. They cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now, I'll guarantee you what. That's proof that Daniel was one mighty man of God. Because this king had no doubt whom he served. And here the king is decreeing. Hopefully, you're going to see, because he certainly didn't have faith in the God of Daniel, hopefully that somehow God could deliver him because he could not. 17, then a stone was brought, laid on the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now, if you don't know, this was like a pit, right? Hole in the, you know, down, uh, honed out in rock or in the ground. And the rock was slid over top of it once they threw you down into the pit. Reading on, you still with me? Verse 18. Now the king went to his palace. Notice this. Why does it say this about the king? I'm going to show you why. Watch this. Most people read this, read right over it, don't even realize why it's in there. The king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep what? Why? He is scared to death. But notice who it doesn't mention doing the same thing. Why does it mention this? Why does it say this about the king? Why is it even in there? I'll tell you why. Because the lack of it not saying Daniel was doing the same thing means that's not what Daniel was doing. Sunday, you're going to see when Peter falls asleep in a jail. And knowing what he's facing the next day, most Christians would not be sleeping. Daniel is not on his knees here crying out to God. We see no evidence. Oh, my God, you must deliver me. My God, what's going to happen? No such evidence. We see zero fear even being revealed from Daniel. Daniel proved it in verse 10, knew the decree, knew what would happen, and yet great faith came upon him to do what? I'm going to worship my... It's easy as a believer to say, well, I wouldn't bow down. You don't know how many Christians would say, what's the big deal? 30 days and the decree's over. Seriously, seriously, 30 days. Just don't pray for 30 days. Just take a 30 day uh, vacation from praying, which most Christians could go 30 days and not pray today. No problem. But take 30 days. Just don't even pray for three, three times a day for 30. And after 30 days, the decree's over. Seriously. And I can go back to praying again. Are you listening? Why not? Why not make that decision? Because great faith said, I don't care. I am not going to stop worshiping and honoring my God. Amen. Amen. So the purpose of verse 18 is to show you that ain't what Daniel was doing. No, it's not. Daniel wasn't fasting before thrown in there. Daniel was not losing sleep, by the way. He got a good night's sleep down there. Amen. Are you listening? Amen. 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out, with a lamenting voice to Daniel, the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God. How many know whom he served? Yeah. I said, how many know whom he served? Yeah. I'll tell you what, people ought to know who you serve. Yeah. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, that was the king saying that. And, the Daniels, and then Daniel said to the king, what was his first words? Okay. What was his first words? Now, O King is a pretty casual statement. Are you listening? O King is just a real, like you didn't know I wouldn't still be here? Yeah. Why? This man's walking in great faith. Yes. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. He don't know how God's going to deliver him, but he knows he's not dying in that lion's den. Right. Why? Great faith. This isn't just some generic, generic type of faith. Why? This was supernatural in its origin. This was a supernatural deliverance by the hand of God, which has to happen through an act of faith. And great faith made that happen. Great faith made God respond. How many understand that you can cry out to God all day long, but until you get in faith, God can't respond? What motivates, what moves God? Faith does. Well, guess what? God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and he don't change. I am the Lord, I don't change. 
What was it that was able to get God's hand to move in the Old Testament? Faith. And in this case, not generic. This was supernatural. This was what? Great faith. That brought a mighty miracle of deliverance for Daniel. Daniel 21 said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. He shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now, he could have declared that before he was ever thrown in there. But he didn't. You know why? Great faith doesn't try to justify itself. <clears throat> Great faith doesn't try to deliver itself. You don't try to become your deliverer. Amen. Great faith knows who the deliverer is. Amen. Let me throw a little nugget out here real quick. I got this from Wigglesworth actually this morning. I never heard it. I've read it how many times and I never saw it before. In talking about God and what God is to us, he's a deliverer. He's a healer. He's peace. Come on. He, he's our victor. He is everything we need. Amen. <clears throat> he stands at the door and knocks. And where he talks about that in Revelation 3, that was actually written to churches. But he said, if anyone, so that's referring to everybody. He said, I stand the knock. If anyone will open the door, I'll come in. Who will come in? Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi. What do you need? Jehovah Sid Canoe. What do you need? See, it's not Jesus just talking about, I'll come get you born again. Because that was written to churches. Amen. What is God? He is your deliverer. He is your healer. But guess what the door is? Faith. Faith opens the door. Faith is the door. <clears throat> faith, because if you think about it, think about how much we focus on our faith. My faith got me healed. No, it didn't. Your faith didn't get you healed because if it did, then faith's your healer. Are you listening? Faith opened the door to your healer. Jesus is the healer. Faith just opened the door for the heater to come in. Right. Faith opened the door for the angel to come in. Right. What brought the angel in? Great faith did. Because this ain't a normal happening. Right. Come on, man. This ain't a normal thing. This ain't going on every day. Right. Are you still here? Yeah. This is supernatural manifestation of God through an angelic host to show up and to keep those lines away from Daniel, however he did it. Yeah. That's supernatural, folks. For an angel to show up and do that? Now, God don't just do that every single day all throughout the Bible. We see that only in response to what? The faith of Daniel. Faith opened the door for the angel to come. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you didn't hear me. Faith opened the door Amen. for the angel to come. What did? Great faith. Amen? Amen? Supernatural faith. My God, 22, sent his angel. He shut the mouth of the lions so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent. 23, now the king was exceedingly glad for him. And why? Because he's the one that goofed up to begin with. Uh, he was exceedingly glad and commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever was found on him, underline it, because he believed in his God. Say it, because he believed in I don't care who you are. You're being told you're going to be thrown to the lions. Nobody has general faith to believe for that. No. No. You understand? That's not a normal faith. No. That's not some great big courage I bring up out of me all of a sudden that I got this great faith that somehow I'm not going to be afraid to be thrown to the lions. Yeah. Are you listening? Amen. I'll tell you what that's called. Great faith. Amen. Because he believed. What did it do? Faith is the door open now to let the angel of God come and deliver him. Amen. If he'd have been crying out, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Oh, Lord, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what, he wouldn't have got delivered. Right. Could I get a better amen? Why? Because he said it. I believe my God. <clears throat> now, listen, no matter what people try to do to you, stop trying to take vengeance on people that try to harm you. Amen. If you do, you hinder God's ability to deal with them. <clears throat> and you hinder your ability to walk in faith. Right. Look at verse 24. The king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Why do you need to know that? They broke all their bones in pieces before they ever got to the bottom of the den. I'm going to tell you why. I've heard people say those lions were like pussycats to Daniel. He was just petting them. I don't believe so. 
I believe they're sitting there bound by an angel wanting to chomp on Daniel. <clears throat> Are you listening? They're, they're wanting to eat this. They're like, well, yeah, praise God. A meal has shown up. Glory be to God. Are you serious? You don't think they're not wanting to eat him? You, you think literally they're not wanting to just jump on him and pounce on him? But guess what? An angel made it possible uh, because of a supernatural manifestation of an angel by the great faith of Daniel that their mouths were shut. I think they were sniffing all around him but couldn't get their mouth open. You know, I'd really like to get a bite of this guy. It says he shut their mouth up. It didn't say he took away their desire to eat him. <clears throat> How do we know? Read verse 24. After being there all night tempted with a human, they couldn't eat. <clears throat> How hungry do you think they were? Starving. And they proved it when the rest of them got thrown in there. Ladies and gentlemen, any such supernatural event that happens for you had to be great faith. Because that is not generic faith. Are you listening? That is not a general form of faith that you walk by. Are you here tonight? Uh, I want you to go to 1 Kings 17. <clears throat> 1 Kings 17. If you honestly believe you got that kind of faith, you don't understand uh, the manifestation of, uh, of great faith. Many of you, and I'll share it real quick, have probably heard the story of one of our spiritual dads, Terry Myers. Terry Myers will tell you, I didn't drum that faith up. I didn't have that faith because I read my Bible and, and preach it to myself and hear it preached all the time. He stopped in Mexico to pick a guy up. <clears throat> and the guy pulled a gun out, made him pull over. And was going to rob him, take his life. Made him get out of the vehicle. Had him strip off all of his clothes but his underwear. And, and after he got uh, to the point of wanting to actually take his stuff, his money and everything, got his wallet and all that, at point blank range, pointed the gun at his chest and said he was going to kill him. What did Terry say? What did Terry say? What did Terry say? You can't kill me. You can say whatever you want, but the average believer does not say that. Many believers have been faced with the, with the confrontation of death with somebody pointing a gun at them, and they don't generally say that. You know what says that? Great faith does. Great faith that rises up in your heart knows. You don't know that without great faith coming upon you to say, you can't kill me. Amen? Amen. And the guy pulls the trigger all five times, had five bullets in the gun and not a single one hit him. Amen. Guess what that was? Great faith, special faith, the gift of faith that did what? Preserved his life, Amen. just like Daniel in the lion's den. Amen. That is not just regular faith here in the word of God preached. Are you here tonight? Yes. First Corinthians 17. <clears throat> Excuse me, first Kings, sorry. <clears throat> first Kings 17. Let's go to Elijah. All right. First Kings 17, verse one. Are you there? And Elijah the Tishbite. Tell somebody, at least you ain't a Tishbite. Praise the Lord. Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, from uh, turn eastward, hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook. Watch this. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. This is not an everyday event. <clears throat> Anybody had God tell you, I'm sending birds to feed you tonight? We have no other account of this ever happening ever. In all the history of humankind. You might just read these kind of stories and think they're just a nice little story, but you don't realize God is telling you, you've never heard this before. For the first time, God is telling you, go, okay, here comes the drought. You prophesied it. As I said, go sit over here by this river. You're going to drink from it, and I'm going to send ravens to feed you. Huh? What? You're going to do what? Ravens? Really? That's how you're going to feed me? I'm going to tell you what, to believe in God's word here took something more than just a generic faith. Right. 
Because if you think about it, not only is it very unusual for some birds to bring your meal twice a day. I mean, that's just mind boggling when you think about it. Not only is that very unusual, on command, on time to show up twice a day, birds are going to do this. And not only are they going to do that, but guess what? You got to have the faith to eat what they're bringing you. Right. Right. Amen. To know what God's given you is going to nourish you and not be full of a bunch of disease and sickness. Right. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Verse 5. What did he do? What did he do? He went. he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is great faith. Amen. He didn't hesitate. He didn't question him about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You sure? Isn't there another way you could do this? Couldn't I just go to some town somewhere? Have some family take care of me? You know, feed me a little uh, grits down here, down the road somewhere. Maybe some chicken dumplings or something. Ravens? Ravens? But he didn't hesitate. I said he didn't hesitate. See, great faith never hesitates. Uh, So he went, did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the book brook. And whether you believe it or not, that's as supernatural as an angel coming and shutting the mouth of the lions. Yes. That every morning on time and every evening, these ravens show up with what? They don't just show up with anything. They show up with bread and meat in the morning. They show up with bread and meat in the evening. You know why? They didn't just show up with bread. Because he's going to wind up going 40 days through the wilderness and he's going to need some strength to get through that time frame. So God's not only providing him food, he's providing him a specific meal of what he needs to prepare for that. This is supernatural in its manifestation in every form. This is not natural occurrence. I said this is not natural occurrence. I, I, I declare to you that the best bird trainers in the world could, I'll guarantee you, not probably be able to train a bird. On time, twice a day, to bring you specific meals two times a day. And to think in your mind that could happen to the human mind, that just goes beyond any full understanding. I'm serious. People say, well, God was talking to them. Man, are you kidding me? God took the children of Israel over to the promised land, sent in 12 spies, and 10 of the 12, seeing everything God said was there, still couldn't believe it. Still couldn't. So don't tell me, well, that's God speaking to Elijah. I'm going to tell you what this is. This is Elijah walking in great faith with his God. That would take great faith to say, no problem, Lord. I'm on my way. I'll go find the spot. I'm going to sit down. I'll wait for my meal. Are you listening? This is great faith, folks. I said, this is great faith. All right, let's look at another story a little further down here. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise from where he was at, go to Zarephath, which belongs to, uh, Z- uh, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow uh, to provide for you. So he rose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. See, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and for my son that we may eat it and die. Watch great faith kick in. I said, watch great faith kick in. What are you going to say, child of God, in that moment? Well, sorry, that's all you got left. Guess we'll have to try to figure out another way to do this. Are you listening? Yeah. I mean, come on. If you walked up to somebody on the street, hey, could you help me out? Uh, could you uh, make a little bit of uh, food for me? Hey, man, I'm living on the street. I got just enough for a last meal. Well, just give me the first little bit of it. You're going to tell them that? Probably not. I said, probably not. This woman's got all she got left just for her and her son. And he's about to speak in a, in a manifestation of great faith to her. Are you listening? 13, Elijah said to her, do you not fear? Guess what, guess what great faith does? It eliminates faith. Uh, excuse me, eliminates fear. 
Great faith eliminates fear. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Bring it to me, and afterward, make some from yourself, for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. I'll tell you what, that word comes to him because of great faith. Amen. You go do it, I'm telling you. Notice what he said. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord says rain, sends rain on the earth. Now, I mean, to decree that, you got to have some great faith to be saying something like that. Are you listening? That's not generic faith in God. That's some great faith being making such a declaration as that. Are you listening? 15. So she went away and did what? According to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. 16. The bin of flour was not used up. How? Supernaturally, it keeps manifesting flour. Why? Because of a man named Elijah who had great faith and was willing to decree what she was to do. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. I mean, we get a word, we're kind of like, well, I kind of think God may have said, but you're telling a woman who's having her last little meal between her and her son. Hey, go ahead and do what you said, but take a little bit of the first part of that and bring it to me because I'm telling you that flour is not going to run empty. That jar of oil is going to stay full. Huh? Really? She's not the one with great faith here. Who is? Elijah is. And a supernatural manifestation of God's provision happens and that flour never ran out. And that jar of oil, I, I don't believe it filled up to the full. I believe every time she took out the flour she needed, she turned around and more flour was there. Amen. Every time she took out the oil she needed, because you know what? God almost always works like this. God doesn't pour out a ton of abundance on you. God says, you learn to trust in me and then I can take you anywhere and know that I'll provide for you no matter what. But you have to have some great faith to walk in that. Amen? Amen. Say great faith. great faith. And what happened? He had manifested a, bl a blessing and provision in this case, not just for the man of God, Amen. but also for her. Right. And it all happened because a man named Elijah had what? Great faith. I'm out of time tonight. Oh, there's so many examples. But I'm going to tell you, you need to remind yourself of this. Great faith it is a manifestation of the Spirit that when it comes, we instantly respond. Whether it's us by faith going into a lion's den, whether it's us by faith saying what God said in relationship as He did to the widow, or even in the context of what He did in relationship to Himself obeying God and knowing the ravens would come. Never questioned it. Immediately responded. Immediately responded. Why? And what happened? What was the result? What was the result? A supernatural... Say supernatural. Let me, let me use a couple more examples real quick to show you a difference here. When, how many remember Samson, when he went to go get his uh, wife that he wanted, how many remember what happened on the way? Remember what he ran into? Ran into a lion. Are you listening? You know what the Bible said about that? The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. What's that? Empowerment. And the Bible says he tore that lion apart with his bare hands right. like he would a kid goat. Are you listening? Was that, don't, don't answer this. Was that great faith? No. Why? God didn't do it for him. He was involved in it. He was actually a working a miracle. He was actually involved in it. That's not great faith. When it's great faith, guess what? God does it all. God would have just totally instantly killed the lion. He'd have never touched it. Right, right. You understand? Yeah, no. did, did Daniel do anything to shut the, the lion's mouth? No. He did not. Did, did Elijah do anything at all to make that flower and that oil manifest? No. He did not. Who did that? God did. So you got to understand that when God manifests in the context of great faith, uh, what is it? It's him doing it. Nice. We're not involved. I said we're not involved. Yeah. He's doing it. And that's how you can know it's great faith because it's his supernatural super natural manifestation to us because of great faith that was released. Amen. 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 And we don't have any part to play in it. He does all of it. Awesome. Pretty awesome. Amen. 
And you're going to see it primarily, primarily in protection and provision. How many think this would be a good thing to be walking in? Pretty good thing, wouldn't it be? So here we have provision for Elijah and the widow. Protection for Daniel in the lion's den. Right? And God will show us through the Bible over and over again. Deliverance for Peter. I mean, it's powerful, man. A uh, fiery furnace for the Hebrew children. Yes. It's God's manifestation of supernatural uh, uh, protection or blessing to us because obviously great faith is released. How many think we should be walking in this gift? Amen. And if we just get close to walking in the Holy Spirit, He can manifest it as He wills. Amen. Amen. Stand your feet. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.